Hello, I'm Rory McKiernan and you're very welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. A heartfelt thanks to all you patrons who continue to chip in and support and promote the podcast in whatever way you can. It's great to have you as part of the Love and Courage community. I hope you're doing good wherever you are right now. Life is starting to get more livelier and busier here in beautiful County Clare in the west coast of Ireland. As part of my transition back out into the world, I had a great few days off recently where I suppose I kind of down tools, removed myself from technology, my phone, the internet, everything for a few days. And I have to say, it done me the world of good. I love technology, but sometimes I think we all need a break. And if you're due a break, I hope you get one very, very soon. It's important to look after ourselves, I think. Um... Part of the busyness in our household has been my wife, Susan Quirk's album launch, her fantastic, stunning debut album, Into the Sea, which has been out a couple of months now. And um, Into the Sea is available on Bandcamp, Spotify, Apple and also true signed CD versions. A lot of people choosing to buy the CD, support the artist direct. And uh, a lot of people also rediscovering the art of the album listening experience, whether it be driving in their car or elsewhere. And uh, something that I've also rediscovered, uh, just the, the art of listening to the album over and over again, hearing new layers, new sounds, getting to know the songs. Um, streaming is great, but um, and we can stream albums too. So just sticking with one album for a while, I've really found that. And there's a, de- a depth that comes with Susan's album and so many other artists as well. S- uh, the album, as I said, is getting a great response. It was chosen by BBC Radio Ulster's Late Show as an album of the week and it got a great review on RT Radio 1 Arena and in Hot Press magazine and the Irish Independent newspaper and elsewhere. And you can check out Susan's music and also her Learn to Meditate courses over at susanquirk.com. She does online regular Learn to Meditate course and also will be doing more in workplaces and community settings as well. So go to susanquirk.com, Q-U-I-R-K-E.com. Also, if you want to connect with me around any of my work, whether it be my campaigning, coaching, mentoring, communications, consultancy work, or indeed my book, Hitching for Hope, feel free to send me an email via my website over at Love and courage.org and you can find me on social media just look up Rory McKiernan now back to the podcast which is the reason you're here I'm sure I'm excited to share that my guest in this episode is someone I hugely admire she very much is a true voice of love and courage Razan Ibrahim is an Irish Syrian journalist and activist she first came to Ireland to do her MA at the University of Limerick and ended up unable to return home after the war started in her native Syria. Razan worked for several years with the Storyful News Agency and recently joined Kinzen as a senior editorial analyst researching misinformation on social media. Part of her past work included contributing additional research to the New York Times visual investigations team that won the Pulitzer Prize last year in 2020. That was with Malachi Brown and the amazing team there in New York. Uh, good to have Malachi flying the flag in there as well. Uh, Razan's deeply personal connection to the tragic situation in Syria prompted her to volunteer on two occasions over two summers, uh, helping refugees arriving in the Greek islands. And that's something she's hugely passionate about and we'd be talking about about in this conversation. Razan is increasingly recognised and rightly so as a trailblazing force for change and she is a recipient of an International Woman of the Year Award by Irish Tatler magazine. Now, I know you're going to enjoy this episode and please do consider sharing it when you can and where you can and wherever best and uh, subscribing as well if you're new to the podcast and leaving ratings, reviews. And if you do want to chip in, become a patron. Loveandcourage.org is where you need to go. It all helps me to get inspirational voices like Razan's out into the world. Now, let's get started with this conversation with Razan Ibrahim. Razan, you're very welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. Um, we were talking recently and um, I realized that you had a similar affinity to Limerick as I do. Um, Limerick is uh, is a city that not everyone knows as well as, as they should perhaps, but you have a particularly soft spot for it. Can we begin by you talking about your connection to Limerick? Because I think it's a big part of your connection to Ireland really, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, Uh, Limerick was my introduction to Ireland. 
I arrived to Ireland 2011 and uh, I landed at Dublin airport straight away to the bus and from the bus to Limerick. And this is when my uh, life story began. This is where uh, the change in my life, uh, the ambition in my life and the success in my life began. So Limerick means a lot to me because it's a station uh, to uh, start a new life and a, a station to meet beautiful people, amazing culture. It is introduction. It was introduction for me to, to know what Ireland is, what uh, Irish culture, Irish people, language, accents, all of that. So absolutely, Limerick was uh, really, uh, I think I'm lucky I started my life in Ireland, in Limerick, because I made amazing friends. Uh, I met beautiful people and I still have them as my best friends till today. And by the way, when uh, I am now based in Dublin and I remember one day I met one somebody and we were chatting that I um I lived in Limerick for three years and he said to me oh you know I am Irish and have never been to Limerick yeah and that was shocking yeah. for me and I was like you are missing a lot <laughs> you should go and see and there's just a beautiful culture nice people um, generous they opened their doors for me you know like I was yeah. always invited to dinners um uh Christmas even Christmas because I used to spend Christmas on my own and and my friends no way you are sp spending on my own come, yeah. come over yeah. so really really enjoyed it um and I loved my life there yeah, I, I I have similar, uh, well, not 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 in any sense the same, of course, but uh, similar sentiment in in terms of the atmosphere of hospitality that I felt amongst people in Limerick. And it's only since I moved to Clare that I've become more familiar with Limerick. So I guess I was interested in that connection from that level as well. Can you take me back to who you were at that particular moment? as you arrived into Limerick on the bus and, or it was a bus, I believe. Um, and what was going on in your mind and what had you come from and where were you going to? And were you scared or, you know, were you excited? What, what, what was on your mind? I was not scared at all. I was super excited. Uh, I was just, uh, um, a woman, young woman who is uh, fulfilling her dreams, who uh, wants to achieve um, her studies uh, and education and um, make her life better. Uh, and a woman who is ready for new challenges and meeting new people, a new culture, all of that. So it was super exciting experience for me. I've never felt any uh, fear or I haven't felt mm. even I was a stranger when I arrived to Limerick. So it was really good start for me. It's not easy, definitely, Rory, because I arrived and I did not know anybody. I had nobody to, uh, to talk to or connection. So I was literally on my own from day one. So it was kind of as well a challenge to create my network, to meet people and create a life for me in Limerick. Mm. Where did that particular dream begin? The one that brought you to Limerick and to brought you on that um, journey of study? It came all from English literature. When I did my when I did my undergrad in Syria, uh, we did English literature, Irish literature, and uh, American literature. So part of the in uh, English and Irish, I definitely studied uh, Shakespeare. Uh, I did as well Christopher Marlowe, and we did a lot of. English um, studies, uh, novel, drama, and then also we also did English literature and big part of it was um, um, Beckett. So my uh, graduation um, project was on Waiting for Godot. So that's all when I was studying, I was like um, 
like in in the love with the with the uh, culture and society and the language um and i wanted to discover more i wanted to know more and i wanted to expand my love to make it more educational professional and more knowledgeable uh and i uh, around that time i did diploma in education and i started uh, to teach but from all that um i just always dreamed to travel abroad and continue my studies. But uh, Rory, I came from um, a mixture of working class family and educated family. So my mom and dad are schools principals, but we are not, uh, we are even in terms of economically, we are not even middle class. You know, our salaries, my, my parents' salaries, extremely low. So we don't, we only have our salaries to pay rent, to eat and drink. So that's what we can do. Uh, but I wanted to finish my studies and I wanted to do master's and graduate from, from good universities um, in, in the world. Um, so around that time, I decided to, work. And I said working and saving money could be the only solution for me um, to, to save money and be able to pay my fees. And I worked abroad uh, for a few years and come back to Syria again. And I also worked and I saved in 10 years my fees for a University of Limerick. Wow, well, it, it took you 10 years of saving, yeah? So yeah, that, 10 years. Serious dedication. Every, every year, 1,000 euro. That's fantastic. It's uh, it's a yeah. great testimony to uh, staying true to the dream. Yeah, absolutely. And in one day, I paid all my savings in one day to the university. But uh, yeah, and this is when I realized I am here in Limerick and I have only one option is to be successful. I can't uh, just all these 10 years working hard and, and arrive to Limerick to do my master's and then I fail. And that's why Rory, like you won't believe I was studying, I'd say every day, at least every day, like five, six, seven hours. Mm. It's like, it was really dedication uh, around that time, but I, I enjoyed it so much. Mm. So take me back to that, to the family you grew up in. Your parents are uh, teachers and principals. And did you have brothers and sisters? And what, what kind of community and environment did you grow up in? What was life like for you when you were a child? So I had a crazy childhood. I lived it to the maximum. So I spent it all in the street, you know, like always playing in the street. And I was a complete utter tomboy <laughs> at even kids in the in uh, at the neighborhood used to call me uh, tarazan or hasan sabi and in arabic they are equivalent to a uh, tomboy yeah so i always wa uh, was playing with the boys uh, football uh, cycling all boys activities so and i really had a wild i'd say childhood um, and my parents at that time, Rory in, uh, in Syria, uh, it was extremely safe um, place for, for people and for kids to play. So that's why there was zero fear from parents leaving their kids outside. So I used to go every day, maybe nine in the morning, come back home around nine evening time, you know, like, so I would disappear literally all this time just playing outside and then come back home. So that, I think, um, I, I consider myself lucky because living a full childhood is very important uh, in any uh, people's life, I think. And that um, kind of formulated my character in the future. Because of this wild childhood, I was raised to be curious, to be adventurous, not to be afraid. Um, I was uh, raised to actually reflect on myself as well, you know, all of that. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I, and I had amazing parents, my mom and dad, uh, and I uh, as well have my sister and brother, they are younger than me. So I am the eldest in the family. Uh, so it was really, really nice life. I enjoyed it. I loved it. And I had 
till today, maybe the best memories ever in my life. Mm. Well, yeah, I certainly get a sense of that um, open eyed curiosity that you still seem to have and the passion for the world out there. So it's it's not really a surprise that you went on to travel extensively as well. Do you think that that curiosity was what led you into the realm of journalism? Absolutely. I always actually wanted to be a journalist. And uh, in, in Syria, or I would say in general, the main principles of journalism is to have access to information, freedom, and democracy. If you don't have these three main uh, components, it's hard to be a journalist, or I'd say it is hard to be a free journalist. So I tried actually a few times in Syria, but everything was blocked. So, uh, and I wanted to speak about certain stuff, but it's not easy because as I said, we want democracy and freedom to be able to express and tell the stories uh, freely. So uh, I tried a few things, as I said, like some blogs, uh, in, like I tried to publish in a newspaper, but not Syrian, Arabic newspaper. Uh, but then I was like, it's hard. It is hard to continue in this. So I did uh, teaching and I enjoyed it so much. I was a teacher for 10 years um, and I taught uh, students from five years of age till 40 and sometimes 50. So uh, still, this is, you know, like really beautiful and I enjoyed it. But when I came to Ireland, I did my master's in education and English language teaching, but circumstances, I was unable to go back home. Then actually I thought, yeah, I had a dream before when I was uh, a kid, a teenager, and I wanted to be a journalist, but I was unable to, to achieve it. Now I am here in a country of freedom and democracy and access to information. And I can do what I want without fear. And this is where I said, yes, I think this is good time for me, even though, Rory, I believe I started late to be a journalist because uh, like usually you would start 2021, 20, you will study journalism and then you will evolve uh, you will evolve your skills, writing skills, research skills, all of that. You know, myself, I started considerably late in journalism. I was 35 years of age. So that's a bit late, but I always believe nothing is too late. When you have determination, when you have the will, the passion, you can achieve what you want. And yeah, I'm happy that I actually take this decision and I changed my career from teaching to journalism. Wow, I think that's a great story. And speaking of the word story, I think a lot of your story does uh, merge into the world of Storyful and that particular company. Can you talk about that? Because it's a, it has an exciting early days story to the company, doesn't it? Absolutely. Uh, I spent six years in Storyfall. Um, and the last uh, two years, I was editor, assistant editor in Storyfall. And I had the best experience in my life. I met amazing people, amazing journalists. Uh, and as well, I uh, it was kind of my introduction to journalism. So it was the first time, you know, I, I invest a lot of time and expertise in journalism, writing, investigation, and all of that. But just to let you, uh, to tell you a very short story before I started Storyful, I was looking for, for just something exciting, you know, something I can express myself Myself and journalism in particular, and I saw Storyful position. I read it and I said to myself, "No, I, I can't do it." You know, I had this low self confidence, and I said, "I don't think this is something that I can do. It is way more than my abilities." And I was like, "Yeah, I'm not gonna apply either." So I did not apply. But then a friend of mine, very good friend of mine, sent me the link of the application. And he said to me, Razan, I think this is perfect for you. And I was like, wow, why does he think that it's perfect for me and it matches me? And I don't think the same. So actually he gave me kind of more confidence. 
in myself just to say, yes, I'm going to apply. I'm going to try my best and see if I can do it or not. And I applied. And after five interviews, I got the job. Five interviews. Wow. Yes. The last one was written exam. So it was not easy process, but um, I started like really um, in an amazing company, amazing people. And what I did from day one till I finished uh, is mainly investigation and verification. And why it was important because social media is full of inaccurate, misleading uh, videos and content. And sometimes we see very important videos, but we don't know where this video is coming from. Is it true or not? So that's where we actually uh, did our best in Storyfall to verify the content coming from social media. But what we focus on as well, the war zone areas, which are really hard to verify and really hard to get accurate and correct information from. So I worked on Syrian content, Iraq, Yemen. Uh, I worked on Lebanon as well, Saudi Arabia. I mean, I think across the region. Mm -hmm. So we discover content from social media. We verify content. By verification, I mean, we verify the source of the video, who is the person who took the video, and second, location of the video, and third, the date of the video. And then after that, we uh, we write the article and publish these articles. And But in Storyfall, we mainly have um, clients working with us. So it's not a very public platform, it mainly for clients, uh, but absolutely really important job. And every day, this kind of journalism uh, prove that it is really important to keep doing that. And especially, as I mentioned before, in the era of misinformation, disinformation across platforms. Mm, absolutely. I think um, it was very much an early innovator in the problems that have now very much come to light and the world is scrambling to address them. Um, so it's it's highly important work and essential to the to the realm of um, peace and democracy, really. And you mentioned earlier that, you know, circumstances prevented you going home. Um, do, do you feel willing to talk about those circumstances and what, you know, what transpired then at home and in Syria and how your life took that turn or, and, and the decisions you made around that? Absolutely. So when I finished my master's in UL and I graduated, uh, that's a turning point. It's a decision you have to make. So um, at that time, I gave away all my winter clothes because I thought, yeah, I'm leaving Ireland, so I don't need these uh, heavy coats and boots and, and umbrella, you know. So I gave everything I have and I kept my kind of like really light clothes. So I gave everything, I uh, gave away my heavy clothes, my winter stuff, all of that. And I was just in, in a way or in a period um, where I, uh, it's a transitional time and I was going back home. But at that time, war was escalating dramatically, non-stop, things getting out of control. And there was movement, a huge movement from Syria towards uh, outside of Syria to safer places. So Syria at that time was extremely dangerous to go to. And then I actually explored other options, Rory, because I did not know about uh, refugees being refugee. You know, I did not know about this concept before. So I was say, okay, if I can't go to Syria, where can I go? Can I go to um, maybe other Arab country, Lebanon or, or um, um, uh, the UAE or any other country that I can work? But at that time, they almost stopped all visas for Syrians because of the war. So then I was in Ireland and uh, I was in a limbo. I did not know what to do and not where to go, who to talk to. But then a friend of mine said to me, you know, Razan, you can apply for asylum here and you can and you can become a refugee. And I was like, what do you mean? What, what does that mean? She said, yes, if you can't go back home, 
and uh, it is a war zone area. This is your right is to seek protection. So, and actually I did, I applied for asylum and after a few months I got refugee status, but it was hard because it's always when you live in a limbo, it is extremely hard. And I now actually um, thinking of all asylum seekers in Ireland who are living in limbo, not only three, four months, but for five, six, and sometimes 10 years. So that is why it's really important for, for governments, for anybody, you not know, just to, to consider and think of these people. So anyway, I, I uh, uh, after that, yes, I became a refugee and I started my life from zero, from scratch. At that time, I had no job, no money, and I had nothing. Uh, at that time, but I was living in Limerick and this is when kind of a new journey um, like starts in my life. Around what age were you? Uh, I, I came to Ireland, I was 30 years of age. So I believe that was around 32. Yeah. Yeah, 32, 33. And so this whole new beginning, starting starting again or starting fresh, how were you in yourself and how did you navigate that in terms of your own well-being, your mental health? You know, did, did, did you have the emotional skills to, in order to navigate all that? It sounds like you, your parents were really, you know, good at helping you navigate life, but surely the pressure was on as well. Absolutely. Uh, a huge pressure, uh, financial pressure. Um, future pressure, you know, like I, I am here and I don't know what to do in my life. But what I like kind of from my childhood and even from myself teaching myself, first, um, I don't run away from my problems. I don't hide from them. I face them and I look into the eye, you know, and just try to solve the problem. So this is one of the things that I always try to do, not to run away, but to face problems. Second, um, like I am as well somebody who express, who is not afraid to cry and not afraid to, to uh, pick the phone and say, no, I don't feel okay. I don't feel happy. I feel down. So I, I, I cry a lot as well. And, that, and I think this helps. Uh, to to ease the pain and take out any sadness or um, negative energy inside you. Uh, it is healing process, I believe. Crying, it is really healing process. So this is, I think, as well helped me. But then at the same time, Rory, I was looking at myself and saying, okay, what I have that I can use, what skills I have different to others that I can use in my life to get a job, to make, uh, to meet uh, new people and to get a better network of people. Like, oh, sorry, I mean a bigger network of people. Uh, so that's, I always uh, reflect on myself, study myself and say, okay, what do I have? Yes, I have, so I have Arabic language. So where can I use this Arabic language? Okay, oh yeah, I can do translation. I can do interpretation. So this is where I started to find something unique in me, different, and use it in, in, in work or in, in my daily life. And I believe that every one of us, every single person, have something special and have something unique that other people don't have. And that's what I believe that we have to work on, on to, to discover yourself and use these um, beautiful things inside you for your benefit. And what I always uh, say, uh, Rory, that I have reconciliation with myself. I know my faults and I, um, and I understand them. And I try to make things better, you know? Um, and this is like in general where I see myself and how this helps me, but it wasn't easy process, of course. And I had a lot of uh, a lot of um, sad moments, especially I was away from my family, like my parents, my sister and brother. I was here on my own. Situation was getting worse, 
And I remember I was unable to call my family for one month, one of the times, because they had no internet connection. And I was, I didn't have money to phone call them, you know? So it was one of the really uh, emotionally draining, but yeah, I mean, patience and always trying my best to appreciate what I have as well. Wow, that that's a, a huge sense of um of perspective and gratitude that you have. Um it's obviously served you very well. When when the war was really in its fullest flight and we saw, well, at least through the limited screen of media and so on, people saw pictures of of people arriving in boats in Greece and elsewhere. Um it, it must have been very challenging to stay focused on your day-to-day work and and not constantly think of your family, your friends, your country. Absolutely, especially when I was doing my master's. I was studying, focused on my studies, but at the same time, I was watching what's happening back home and the images, the videos, the photos of the children and women. Um It is something I have never seen even in movies or cinema. It is something that no one even can imagine. And uh, that was really hard for me to continue. And I was unable to study. I was unable to have a balance between my studies and my my thinking of my home, home country. And my dad, I was talking to my dad once and I was explaining to him, about the situation. And he said to me, Razan, don't watch the news now. Focus on what you what you are uh, studying right now. This is extremely important. This is your dream. You, 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 you need to keep your dream and, and finish it, you know? So, and I did actually for a while when I was doing my master's, I did not watch um, news for a while. Uh, I finished my master's, then I came back to news and I worked in social media before Storyful. And this is where I was exposed to, to really these images and the Syrian war, uh, videos from, from like one of the really most heartbreaking, shocking uh, videos you can ever see in your life. And that was extremely kind of draining, not only for me, for every Syrian. Because to see such a beautiful country with beautiful culture and society being destroyed slowly, slowly, and no one is doing anything, and no one is trying to stop or to help the people, or or even to create peace. So we were left alone, you know, so we were neglected by everyone And the international community, everyone didn't care about what's happening in Syria. And they let this bloodshedding continue. Uh, That's really draining for every Syrian. And it is not easy to come across that, or it's not easy as well to come to um, uh, keep a blind eye of what's happening. We are Syrians, we are in the middle of that. So it was extremely hard, uh, Rory, and uh, this is when I decided actually to volunteer and do something for the people because I did not want to be only witnessing on social media. I I wanted to act. I wanted to do. I wanted to meet the people in refugee camps, talk to them, help them. You know, that was extremely important. So uh, that journey then took you to one of the Greek islands, was it? Yeah. Yes, I went to Kos Island uh, in 2015. And then the next year I went to um, Samos Island. So, yeah, I mean, it was really uh, important uh, to see in my own eyes what is happening Mm. and to see the real struggle of people. Um, And I met... I can't tell you how resilient the people I met in refugee camps. Um, So every day I would wake up two or three in the morning 
go to the beach with a group of volunteers and wait for refugees to come over uh, from Turkey on boats. So when we see them on the shore, we rush to them, provide them with water, um, shoes, food, blankets, whatever they need. But uh, like one of the stories that I will never forget, um, a big boat arrived full of children and women. One of the women arrived with her children and she was counting. Yes, I have my first child, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Where is my fifth child? Where is Ali? I don't see Ali. And Ali disappeared in, in the sea and they lost it. They lost him and they were unable to go back or look for him. He's gone. And, you know, like just to see her reaction, the woman reaction, um, the desperation in her face and all of that, that is really heartbreaking. But then I was there. I was there to help. I was I was there to take care of the kids and help them find a tent, food, water, you know, sleeping for a few days. And then they continued their journey to Germany. And one, uh, another story, Rory, that um, I was helping some refugees and a guy came to me and he said, uh, excuse me, I need shoes. I don't have shoes. Can you please provide me shoes? I was like, absolutely. So I straight away went. So because like we are volunteers and we have, uh, we fundraise as well. So we have collection of food, anything they need besides to clothes and shoes. So I gave him shoes and I was chatting to him. He said, yeah, I am an engineer and um, I live in Homs, I, as far as I remember. And now I am here and they and then they continued their journey with his friend. Uh, that was 2015. 2020, last year, I received a random message on my Facebook. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Who's this person? So I was reading this message and it says, hi, Razan, I've been looking for you for, for five years. And I, I want just to let you know, thank you for the shoes that you gave me. I am now in Sweden. I am doing language courses and I got a job, but I just want to find you and to thank you again for the shoes that you gave me that day. So that really made my day and made me feel that what I did was not going in vain. You know, it, it was important, important stuff. That's powerful. Absolutely. I mean, on any given day, I don't think most people think about their shoes that much. You just reach for your shoes and perhaps a, perhaps a choice of shoes. And obviously it, it meant so much to this man's dignity and welfare that years later he sought you out, you know. Absolutely. Um. Did you find then when you returned from those um, trips that there was such a disconnect with the average person in Ireland that, you know, maybe we give it five minutes thought or 20 minutes thought or um, but then we have to go about our business. And like in some ways we're so insulated or choose to be from that reality. Um, you find it hard to kind of integrate back into just pretending you didn't see this. Uh, extremely hard. I arrived to Ireland after that and I went to my home and I suddenly looked and I saw roof and bed and I saw warm, warm bed and I can actually have shower and I can eat whatever I want. Um, and that really brought back all this experience that to appreciate what I have and to sense of gratitude but at the same time Rory I got really down when I came back from Greece because the stories I saw and the people I met that I was unable to to find a way to help more or to change something uh, here when I arrived to Ireland and I felt what can I do to them so I felt extremely down helpless that I had no no notion what can I do to 
to make things better for the people. And I stayed in my room for, for a few days and I was unable to go anywhere. You know, I felt disconnect with the whole world and very angry. That was another feeling that I was extremely angry that we have one of the biggest wars, one of the biggest humanitarian crises after the Second World War. And we are not seeing people helping or finding solutions for that. So that was kind of felt angry, felt I, I felt I am useless, I am helpless, I am hopeless, you know, all of these. Um, for a few days, stayed in my room. But then I, I woke up one day and just, it's reflection. And I said, yeah, wake up, Razan, because if you are not strong and you, if you are not solid from inside, you are unable to help people and you are unable to make change in people's life. And this is what I did. I just stand again, stood again on my feet and I started to think, yes, what can I do now? I am here in Ireland, but I definitely can do something. So I started to raise awareness, right stories about what I have seen and tell the stories of the people I met. And I believe this is really important because we need to show the human side of any war because these humans, children, women, civilians are paying the hefty price. And we need to show people that politics is so dirty and who is paying the price are the civilians. So I want to tell the stories of the people but at the same time, I was working on projects, uh, helping people inside refugee camps in, in Greece and even in Syria. So kind of created network of people who are willing to help. We gathered ourselves and we every now and then we will find some good uh, project that we can work on and direction. You know, like what, what I always like to do is to have a direct help, direct change. You know, I know that this money that I am sending or this, uh, for example, uh, medicine that I am sending, they are going directly to this family and they are directly helping the family. So this is exactly what I started to do. And I'm doing that till now. Wow. It, uh, it sounds like you don't stop very often. Like, do you ever have a holiday? <laughs> I... I think I am happy when I help people. Yeah. I find it, re this is my personal personality. This is me. Yeah. You know, wh whenever I help people and I feel that I am making people's life better, yeah. changing their life, even if it's a small thing, you know, even if I uh, was able to help in bringing, for example, um, a laptop for a refugee. Like we had like year one refugees at Rezan. I need a laptop. I was like, yeah, don't worry. I will try to find somebody who is who who can yeah. donate. You know, like even little small things that I can help. This makes me happy, and this makes me going, and makes me I have um, an a purpose, an aim in my life. You know, uh, and this is as well. Like I don't really have uh, days off. I never had a day where I sat and I did nothing. There's always something either I'm doing or something in my mind, you know. And yet you you still you come across as very healthy and radiant and energetic and positive. So you seem to be able to manage that level of energy without losing energy as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, because. I need to keep going and help people and I need to um and I I always believe as well that I have a lot of things that I has I haven't shown as well you know I want to work more on myself and uh, and create something you know I don't know what's this thing I don't know but just to create something connect people and trying to take the best out of people, you know, uh, this is really makes me always going and knowledge as well. You know, I'm always in state of discovery and I want to, to know more about that, discover that, you know, get more knowledge. 
I'm, I'm curious about the world and the people. So this is as well makes me always kind of um, like my state of mind is always busy, always thinking, you know. Um, I always as well have projects, uh, but maybe 90% of these projects doesn't work and they, they never have um, any ending, you know, and they don't even, I was unable to achieve them. But I always try to have uh, an ob objective, a small project to work on or to look forward to. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, this is me. You know, it's it's part of my character that I am this little uh, kid in Syria who was super crazy, adventurous. And I still have this in me till today. I'm going to be 40 in a few months. So I'm still I still have it, which is good. <laughs> It is good. Um, I'm thinking of your original nickname of Tarzan and yeah. <laughs> Tarzan Razan. <laughs> That's exactly. They they used to, the kids used to uh, follow me clapping, Tarzan, Tarzan, like that, <laughs> you know, like just, it was really fun, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> Love it. I love it. So um, uh, there might be people listening here that uh, are curious about your projects, or I'm just wondering myself if there's any particular project that you're working on now or would like to. And because perhaps there's somebody listening that might connect into it and like to assist or contribute. Absolutely. So I am actually working on several projects. Uh, part of the project is helping directly Syrian families living in Ireland in their problems. So uh, there could be uh, something related to education, medical, housing, uh, all of that, you know, integration as well, English. So this is kind of private and it is individually helping people. However, one of the biggest projects I am working on right now, and um, it will have more impact, I believe, in the future, is community sponsorship. So, and we call it as well, open communities. So this project is a combination, like it's, um, I would say, different NGOs and humanitarian organizations are involved in this project. So we have Amnesty International, um, we have Refugee Council, NASC in Cork, and then United Nations, UNHCR, so we are, and Red Cross as well. All these NGOs, uh, we are getting together, I am part of the uh, adv adv um, uh, advisory board. No. Yeah, I am part of the advisory board. So we are all together to create this program. So what's this program? What is open community or community sponsorship? It is actually a beautiful, unique idea. It involves um, Irish uh, uh, group living in Ireland. They connect each other, like would be maybe seven, eight, ten Irish people in one group, each one of them has a specifically, for example, um, they are from different walks of lives, but they are as well, uh, they know each other in a way or another, but they have one objective, which is to bring a Syrian family to Ireland. So they get together, they do fundraising, and then after that, the, uh, this group like United Nations, and all these NGOs, they help them to bring a Syrian fam family from Lebanese refugee camp to Ireland. So this Irish group becomes their friends, their close buddies for one year and a half. They help them integrate into society, help them uh, study English, help them in their education, medical stuff, anything they want. And then after one year and a half, uh, they say, goodbye, you are settled now in Ireland and you have a new life and now it's time for you to be independent. So it's a great example of directly helping refugees to build a new life here in Ireland. And I actually believe this program is going to be better from resettlement program for many reasons. And the most important one is because uh, this Irish group will be friends with the family for one year and a half all the time. You know, they will be always in contact with them. Whereas the resettlement program, 
uh, usually the family will have one worker or one official but they are not in always in communication you know they sometimes don't communicate all the time and they find the families find it hard to integrate whereas with the community sponsorship it is kind of a big way an important way of integration into the society with the help of the irish group mm. yeah it makes perfect sense absolutely um i know myself from moving to uh claire a few years ago and not knowing someone just on a surface level, you know, there's always people that I know who know other people, but I know then from having met uh, people in direct provision in Clare that they're in an entirely different place because they're, they don't have access to cars, transport, sometimes language skills, sometimes access to cook their own food. So that friendship component uh, is, is so vital. And then we know also that the state does provide some supports, but you know, we connected in the past around his family in Longford and yeah. how, you know, th- there might be a level of care, but then there's a level of carelessness as well that can lead to deep vulnerability and suffering. And in that one case, I'll just highlight it briefly where it absolutely at its extremest point led to a pregnant lady sleeping in a car to get warm from the heat of the car. So in modern Ireland, we just can't accept that and we need alternatives because it's not necessarily about money, is it? The money is is there. Absolutely. It's not, not about the money at all. It's about connection. It's about people are coming to Ireland. Let's make the best out of it. You know, all these people have skills, have education uh, could, uh, from different walks of lives. Let's take advantage. Let's, uh, let's look that what skills they have and help them thrive and integrate into the, uh, to, uh, into the Irish society. But actually, Rory, as you mentioned this story, I'm seeing now different stories very similar that they that they don't feel they are connected. They feel that they are neglected in a way or another, um, that people are not listening to them, to their like struggle and concerns because... Like coming from different culture here to Ireland, and then suddenly they feel themselves alone, you know, lonely. So they need always a society around them to help them thrive and and have a good life, you know. So absolutely, it is so important to create connection and communication. I always believe communication is so important in everything. So we need to work on that. Absolutely. And there's, there's something that everybody can do in this story as well, isn't there? Um, absolutely. So Rosanne, you, you have a, you, you have a new job. It's relatively new. Can you, can you tell me about that and uh, what, what it entails and what kind of company is, is it? Absolutely. So I started with Kenzen. And uh, that was two months ago, actually, you know, like really uh, exciting times. Uh, so uh, Kenzen, uh, what we do in Kenzen, we research misinformation, disinformation on social media, and we um, early identify evolving campaigns and narratives of disinformation. But what we also do, and it is unique and innovative, we uh, take the best out of journalism expertise, human expertise, and combine them with the technology to scale up the early detection of misinformation. So we are in this misinformation spectrum. Wow. So, you've, yeah. got the, you've got the elevator pitch down. I hope you meet someone with lots of money that can invest because you've got it down. Yeah, absolutely. Seconds. It's yeah. really, really great idea. And I really enjoy what I do uh, because it's so important. And it is yeah. responsibility, I believe, as well from everybody yeah. to be to really tackle this problem because it is harmful and dangerous. Absolutely. Um, and that was co-founded, I believe, by Anya Kerr. And is Mark Little involved as well? Uh, he's, absolutely. He's co-founder definitely. as well. Yeah. yeah OK, yeah. so there's, you've got a bit Little. of a bit of a dream team going on there, do you? And interesting thing that Storyful was founded by Mark Little. 
Yeah, yeah. And now we have Kenzen as well, founded by Mark Little and Onyeker. And both they founded Storyful and Kenzen as well. So uh, that's really exciting time to be part of, of the team again and work with amazing people, honestly, in, in the media industry. Yeah, and it's just so relevant. Um, obviously, it, it came to the fore during uh, previous US elections. And then we've seen it through Brexit and in recent times, um, particularly the, the you might say that there's a pandemic of misinformation running in, parallel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We call it infodemic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it is really pandemic of misinformation. Yeah, and it's it's affecting. Uh, it it really is a virus. It's affecting communities and families, and and it poses a threat to public health. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And especially, Rory, just to mention here, like two important things, like why we are looking as well uh, on two part- main uh, misinformation, COVID itself and the vaccination. So there is a huge misinformation around. Um, these two subjects and sometimes like okay you have opinion that's no problem and it should be respected we all listen to each other but spreading misinformation is not right you know spreading false narrative this is dangerous the other one is actually uh why we find it important because what we what I follow a lot on uh, during my work is conspiracy theory QAnon yeah. uh, MAGA all of this crazy world. Oh dear. Yeah, <laughs> My so. mental health has suffered as a result of these things. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, and I and it's really important to highlight, you know, like to monitor what's going on in this spectrum because uh, they led, this misinformation in this spectrum led to a capital insurrection in January 6th. Yeah. And that was the biggest attack on democracy. Yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. And, and uh, is it fair to say that um, Ireland is not immune? Obviously, we're affected by the misinformation concerning the UK, Europe, America, but there, there's always a threat that it can interfere in our own internal politics and systems. Absolutely, and uh, during my work, there was a lot of connection between the narrative in the US affecting Ireland, influenced like Irish here. It, not, I would say um, the far right influenced as yeah. well by the American and by, by the UK. So uh, it is the, it is there. We are not immune, but what I always rely on is on the Irish. Um, like Irishness, you know what I mean? Because um, like Ireland is with peace with itself and we need to maintain that. We need to work on connecting with each other and communicate with with each other because the other voices will become uh, irrelevant, you know, not even, uh, there's no importance for them, but we need to, to, to keep the dialogue between each other as society, as community. And, uh, and really this false information and false narrative uh, should be tackled, you know, by the media, by journalism and independent journalism as well. Well said, well said. Well, Razan, I think uh, this is only going to ever be a fraction of the story of your story and the the many stories you've already had in your life. But I have a real sense of that there, there's going to be a lot more to your life story and many more amazing adventures to come. And um, I feel a lot of exciting, successful projects on the horizon and I uh, wish you huge success and encourage people to check out your work more and uh, support where you can. And thanks for uh, thanks for your, your time and being on the podcast. Thank you so much. It's an honor for me. I enjoyed it so much um, talking to you, Rory. And I'm so like privileged to be part of Love and Courage. So you gave me a lot of that. So thank you. <laughs> thanks, Razan. Uh, Lots of love and courage to you and uh, we'll talk again. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello, Ruri here again. A huge thanks to Razand for that wonderful conversation, for her inspiration, for her stories, for her life and for her sharing. She's an amazing person and I look forward to following her journey and supporting her where I can and encourage people to keep an eye out for her. And thanks for listening to the podcast. Do check out the archive if you're new and please do subscribe, rate, review, all those things. They help get voices like Razan's out into the world. And if you want to chip in on a once off or monthly basis, please head over to loveandcourage.org. And you can also, if you feel inclined and you enjoy the episode, send a link to share it with friends, family, colleagues, all those kind of things it all helps and matters now thanks again for your ears for your support for being part of the love and courage community really appreciate all the support until next time